For decades, Yamaha built the perfect engine, then made it disappear. Yamaha's two-stroke outboard engines were the gold standard of marine power, delivering incredible performance, legendary reliability, and that unmistakable punch that could get your boat on plane faster than you could save fish on. Here's a mind-blowing fact that'll make every boat owner's head spin. Yamaha's high-pressure direct injection engines were so advanced, they were injecting fuel at 700 PSI, while their competitors were struggling with 90 to 250 PSI. However, in what can only be described as one of the marine industry's most controversial decisions, Yamaha quietly pulled these engineering marvels from the American market, leaving thousands of die-hard two-stroke enthusiasts scrambling to find replacement engines and wondering what the hell just happened to the most reliable outboards ever built. Let's rewind the clock and find out what happened. Before we dive into this maritime mystery, let's talk about what made Yamaha's two-stroke outboard so special. Picture this, you're out on the water with 200 horses of pure, unadulterated power sitting on your transom. No heavy oil changes, no complex valve trains, just simple, bulletproof engineering that starts every time and runs like a Swiss watch. The crown jewel of Yamaha's two-stroke lineup was undoubtedly their High Pressure Direct Injection Series, or HPDI for short. These revolutionary engines were a quantum leap in marine technology. The HPDI system used a crankshaft-driven high-pressure fuel pump that delivered fuel at pressures ranging from 700 PSI on the 2.6-liter engines, up to an incredible 1,015 PSI on the larger 3.3-liter blocks versus the competition's measly 90 to 450 psi of conventional direct injection. This massive pressure differential meant superior fuel atomization, more complete combustion, and that perfect marriage of fuel efficiency with raw two-stroke power that made these engines legendary. The 150, 175, and 200 are some of the best two-stroke motors built by Yamaha, and here's why these engines became legends. Built on Yamaha's bulletproof 2.6-liter 76-degree V6 block, these engines struck the perfect balance between power and reliability. The 200 HPDI in particular became the stuff of legend. The 2.6-litre V6 Yamaha engine in its carburetted OX66 and HPDI incarnations is utterly reliable. These engines featured Yamaha's sophisticated engine management system that used multiple sensors, crank position, throttle position, timing, RPM, water temperature, air temperature, atmospheric pressure, and most impressively, an industry-exclusive oxygen sensor that continually monitored the exhaust gases. The computer analyzed all this data and automatically adjusted ignition timing and fuel mixture to each individual cylinder for maximum power and fuel efficiency, and fewer emissions during the next combustion cycle. This was basically automotive-level technology in an outboard motor, years before the competition caught up. What made these engines so special? For starters, they were lighter than their four-stroke counterparts. We're talking about a significant weight advantage that could make or break your boat's performance. The four-strokes are 10% heavier than the HPDI when you figure in the three gallons of oil the HPDIs were carrying in the oil tank. That weight difference meant better hole shots, higher top speeds, and less stress on your boat's transom. The HPDI system also solved one of the biggest problems plaguing other direct injection systems, lubrication. While competitors were dealing with engines self-destructing because oil couldn't reach the top piston rings, Yamaha engineered a patented bottom piston ring with a taper for oil bypass every 30 degrees. Those 12 tapered areas around the ring allowed sufficient oil to reach and lubricate the top ring, preventing the catastrophic failures that plagued other manufacturers. But here's where it gets interesting and controversial. The 200 VMAX HPDI is really putting out 225 horsepower, according to many in the boating community. Yamaha essentially detuned a 225 horsepower engine and called it a 200. The throttle body would only open up to three quarters throttle. Talk about under promising and over delivering. 
If you're loving this deep dive into marine engine history and want to see more content about the boats, engines, and gear that really matter to us weekend warriors, smash that subscribe button right now. I've got tons more content coming about the engines and boats that shaped American boating culture. Now, not all HPDI engines were created equal, and this is where things get spicy. Walk away if it has a 225, 250, or 300 HPDI on the back of the boat. That's the advice you'll hear from every seasoned mechanic, and there's a damn good reason for it. The larger HPDI engines, the 225, 250, and 300 horsepower models, were built on Yamaha's 3.3-liter block and they had a serious Achilles heel. The failures seen in the big block 3.3-liter models seemed to be predominantly due to detonation. These engines were notorious for destroying their number one and number two cylinders, often with catastrophic results. Here's the technical breakdown that'll make your head spin. The big block HPDIs were running fuel pressures up to 1,015 PSI, even higher than their smaller siblings. That's incredible engineering, but it came with a cost. The normal pressure for the HPDI HP pump is 1,015 PSI, plus or minus 217 PSI. That's a massive tolerance. We're talking about potential pressure variations of over 20% that could result in significantly leaner air fuel mixtures. The real kicker? These engines didn't have knock sensors. The HPDI does not utilize a knock sensor, a decision that still baffles marine mechanics today. When you're pushing an engine to 4,000 plus RPM for extended periods offshore, detonation becomes a real threat, especially when combined with marginal fuel delivery from partially clogged injectors or filters. Here's the smoking gun. The reason is not enough oil is mixed at mid-range RPMs. When you're running at those sweet spot cruising RPMs where most of us spend our time, these big block HPDIs weren't getting adequate lubrication to the top end. The oil pump wasn't being spun fast enough to deliver sufficient oil while the engine was under heavy load, but not at wide open throttle. The result? Scorched pistons, blown rings, and repair bills that could buy you a decent used car. The maintenance reality was eye-opening too. These engines had 16 filters, but only three were replaceable by the average boat owner. The so-called mystery filters hidden inside the high-pressure fuel pump required complete pump disassembly to access, and Yamaha officially said they couldn't be serviced. Smart mechanics learned to rebuild these pumps anyway, but it wasn't cheap or easy. Yamaha eventually acknowledged the problem and developed a fix, a new oil pump that would deliver more lubrication at those critical mid-range RPMs. But by then, the damage to their reputation was done, and the EPA was breathing down everyone's necks. Here's where our story takes a dramatic turn, and frankly, where things get a little political. Congress passed the Federal Clean Air Act in 1970 and gave the newly formed EPA the legal authority to regulate pollution from automotive and other engines. In the early 1990s, the EPA began its phase-in to limit emissions from small gasoline engines, including outboard motors. EPA's goal was to reduce those pollutants and others by 75% by the year 2006. At the time, practically all outboard motors were traditional two-strokes, except a few small four-stroke engines under 50 horsepower. The problem was real. Carburetted two-stroke engines could emit up to 25-30% to of their fuel unburned into the water or atmosphere. Some of the unburned fuel and oil discharged through the exhaust system made its way into the surrounding air and water from older carburetted two-strokes. Fair enough, nobody wants to see oil slicks following every fishing boat. The EPA worked with the marine industry to draw up regulations and gave manufacturers a timetable for compliance, along with credits for early adoption of reduced emissions. This created a fascinating competitive dynamic, where manufacturers could bank emission credits by selling cleaner engines ahead of schedule, then use those credits to keep selling dirtier engines longer. It was environmental policy meets Wall Street trading. But here's where it gets controversial. Yamaha's HPDI system was actually meeting the emission standards, yet they still pulled them from the American market. 
The HPDI engines exceeded the federal EPA 2006 emission requirements, as well as earning a California CARB two-star rating for very low emissions. Think about that for a second. Yamaha had spent millions developing a two-stroke engine that met the EPA's stringent requirements, yet they abandoned the technology anyway. California set the pace for the whole planet on pollution control, and the California Air Resources Board established a star rating system that became the industry standard. The three-star rating emission requirement is 65% cleaner than the already stringent 2006 EPA limits. Both Mercury and Evinrude were able to design and manufacture three-star certified two-stroke outboards using their Optimax and E-Tech technologies respectively. The Yamaha two-stroke engine was the only one that didn't make the cut for the three-star certification, and it was quietly pulled off the American market. Why? The writing was on the wall. The future was four-stroke, whether we liked it or not. The F-225 was well under the 2006 voluntary regulation values for exhaust gases established by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Japan Boating Industry Association. Yamaha saw which way the wind was blowing and decided to go all-in on four-stroke technology instead of investing more millions trying to get their HPDI systems to achieve three-star certification. By the mid-2000s, something unprecedented was happening in the marine industry. Due to these reasons, Yamaha stopped making the saltwater version HPDI 150 and 175 one and a half years ago, and the writing was on the wall for the entire HPDI lineup. The Yamaha two-stroke engine was the only one that didn't make the cut, and it was quietly pulled off the American market. It is now sold mostly in third-world countries without stringent emission requirements. While Mercury's Optimax and Evinrude's E-Tech managed to achieve the coveted three-star carb rating, Yamaha made a strategic decision that still puzzles industry insiders today. They just abandoned the American market for this technology. If this story is making you think about that HPDI sitting in your garage, or the one you've been eyeing on the used market, Drop a comment below and let me know what your experience has been. And don't forget to hit that notification bell, because we're just getting started on this marine engine deep dive. Yamaha didn't just abandon two-strokes, they revolutionized four-strokes. The F-225 was as compact and lightweight as a two-stroke engine, with the same horsepower despite being a large four-stroke outboard motor. This was no small feat. Traditional four-strokes had always been heavier, more complex, and frankly less exciting than their two-stroke cousins. The F-Series engines that Yamaha developed incorporated some seriously impressive technology. We're talking about dual overhead cam systems, electronic fuel injection, and computer-controlled everything. Yamaha offers a full model lineup in four-stroke engines, but let's be honest, were they better? That depends on what you value. Four-stroke engines are undeniably more fuel-efficient, especially at trolling speeds. They're quieter, they don't smoke, and they all meet the emissions requirements without breaking a sweat. Due to Yamaha's design and engineering excellence, their outboards typically last for 1,500 and up to 3,500 hours before needing a major overhaul. This is where things get heated in marina parking lots across America. The two-stroke faithful argue that nothing beats the instant throttle response, the lighter weight, and the simplicity of a good two-stroke. The HPDI also tended to foul out the plugs at trolling speeds, but have a little faster hole shot. Two-stroke guys will tell you that when your engine breaks down 50 miles offshore, you want something simple that you can actually fix with basic tools. They'll point out that two-strokes are cheaper to buy, easier to work on, and deliver more power per pound than any four-stroke ever will. A typical HPDI owner might burn about $662 worth of oil in 100 hours of operation, based on $25 per gallon for Yamalube. But they argue that's still cheaper than the complex maintenance requirements of four-strokes. But let's talk real numbers here. 
the maintenance reality was eye-opening for HPDI owners. These engines required religious attention to their fuel systems. VST filters, high-pressure pump filters, and injector cleaning every 100 to 150 hours. The fuel system had multiple stages, low-pressure pumps delivering at least 3 psi, medium-pressure pumps maintaining 40 to 50 psi at the VST, and that high-pressure pump cranking out those incredible pressures. Each stage had its own failure points and maintenance requirements. Smart HPDI owners learn to run ring-free fuel additive in every tank, change all serviceable filters religiously, and always use premium fuel. Those who followed the maintenance schedule often saw their engines run for a thousand hours plus without major issues. Those who didn't, well, let's just say the marine salvage yards are full of HPDI powerheads that met an early demise. Four-stroke converts, on the other hand, love the fuel economy and the quiet operation. The four-stroke requires expensive oil also when it needs a change. But they argue that the longer service intervals and better fuel economy more than make up for it. They appreciate not having to mix oil or deal with the smell and smoke of burning two-stroke oil. A modern Yamaha four-stroke typically lasts for 1,500 and up to 3,500 hours before needing a major overhaul, significantly longer than most two-strokes. The fuel economy difference was particularly pronounced at trolling speeds, where four-strokes could run for hours on minimal fuel while HPDI engines, despite their advanced technology, still consumed more fuel and were prone to fouling plugs during extended low-speed operation. This became a major selling point for charter captains and serious fishermen who spent long days on the water. Here's something most people don't know. There's a thriving underground market for HPDI engines and parts. Many, many, many big block VZ, VMAX owners have nary a problem, and these engines are becoming increasingly sought after by enthusiasts who know how to maintain them properly. Smart boat owners are hoarding HPDI parts, especially for the bulletproof 2.6-liter engines. Oil pumps, injectors, and ECU modules are selling for premium prices on the secondary market. Some dealers are sitting on new old stock parts that are worth their weight in gold to HPDI owners. The irony? The 200 HPDI is probably the best direct fuel injection engine ever made, yet you can't buy a new one anywhere in America. So, what's the takeaway from this marine engine soap opera? If you're in the market for a used boat with a HPDI, stick with the 2.6-liter engines, the 150, 175, and 200 horsepower models. Avoid the big block 3.3-liter engines unless you're getting a screaming deal and you're prepared for potential engine work. For new engine buyers, Yamaha's current four-stroke lineup is undeniably impressive. The technology has matured, the reliability is excellent, and the fuel economy is better than anything we had in the two-stroke era. But you'll never get that instant throttle response and raw excitement that made HPDI engines so addictive. The real tragedy, the disappearance of the last major two-stroke engine brand in the recreational boating market, marks a turning point when Evinrood pulled the plug on their e-tech production in 2020. We're watching the end of an era, folks. Looking ahead, the marine industry is heading toward even more advanced four-stroke technology, hybrid systems, and eventually electric propulsion. But for those of us who grew up with the sound of a properly tuned two-stroke at wide open throttle, nothing will ever quite compare. Yamaha made a business decision that probably saved them millions in development costs and regulatory headaches. They pivoted to four-strokes, dominated that market, and never looked back. But they left behind a legion of two-stroke faithful who still believe they built the perfect engine and then made it disappear. The story of Yamaha's HPDI engines is really the story of American boating culture changing forever. We went from raw power and mechanical simplicity to computer-controlled efficiency and environmental consciousness. Both have their merits, but man, I miss the days when you could diagnose an engine problem by the color of the smoke coming out of the exhaust. If you've made it this far, you're clearly as obsessed with marine engines as I am. Do me a favor and subscribe to the channel, because I've got tons more content coming about the engines, boats, and gear that shaped our boating culture. 
Hit that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and let's keep the conversation going in the comments. What's your take on the great two-stroke versus four-stroke debate? And if you've got a HPDI story, good or bad, I want to hear it. Until next time, keep your props in the water and your engines running strong.